Herzlich a warm welcome to all our viewers to our series Natural Medicine Today. What prevents us from walking without problems again and again? Arthrosis in the joints, often also in the knees. But today it's all about the hips, hip arthrosis operations with artificial hip joints are also very high frequency now and what innovative methods there are to avoid this drug and surgical craze will be explained today by our movement expert Karl Müller and I look forward to an interesting solution to the pain problem. See you soon. Hello, Karl. Hello, dear Carl. Thank you for coming. Hello, Karina. Thanks for having me. Yes. What fascinates me so much about your work is that people really become pain-free with you. We've already had great interviews also with the minister who even sat in a wheelchair for two years after a bomb attack. And then we saw really great before and after videos. How a lot has changed, and today we specifically talk about the hip problem. I have often met people who are quite young, younger than 50, and already told me they already have an artificial hip, where I thought, huh? So that always leaves me speechless. How does it happen that such operations are carried out so early? Yeah, first of all, not everyone will be free of pain, of course, but almost everyone will be with less pain. That's the way it is, because in general, we tend to look at the cause, where does the pain come from, and work on the cause, instead of giving any medication or operating symptomatically. You can, of course, work on the symptom. So, when you rub something in, when all the muscle fascia are so blocked, you can, of course, to solve this blockage, you can also use a remedy that develops heat to loosen something. Other methods are fascial therapies where you press enormously or with dry needling or there are of course many methods that are good or are very good but they don't treat the cause, they don't fight the cause but they break the vicious circle of tensions, blockages and reduce mobility. In some cases, of course, or actually one could always do it, you just have to know that you have to work on the cause. What I would never recommend, or almost never unless it's a serious accident, are surgeries. So with degenerative wear and tear or orthopaedic problems that have come so slowly over time, I've never met anyone or had a case in mind where I would operate. What I also find so fascinating when you go to the osteopath and say this is where it hurts. And that was the case with me. On the top right shoulder, somewhere behind the shoulder blade, there was something. And then the lady starts working on the ankle and says, have you ever twisted it? I say, no idea, but probably. And then she straightened my ankle and my shoulder was better. Where I think, actually totally stupid if we then operate on the hip, when probably, if my shoulder is related to the ankle, the hip is slightly related to something else as well. Yeah, yeah, well, ankle and shoulder makes total sense because when I look at the entire fascial apparatus, it's such a coherent construct that springs so elastically. If I shorten it down there, then of course it shortens up there too. And everything on the fascial apparatus that is no longer physiological not only has an impact on the shoulder, maybe also in between, maybe also in the digestive system. 
It's all connected. I found that interesting too. There was a patient at the osteopath with knee problems and then they treated the intestines. And I find that so beautiful. Well, we'll get to stuff like this regarding hip arthrosis in a minute. Because this is really a very common surgery. And I think hips are still more commonly operated on than knees. On the knees, maybe with an accident. With uh, meniscus surgeries, uh, sports injuries and such. Knee replacement tends to come later than a hip replacement. And this is also easier, faster. A knee replacement is also a bigger procedure than hip replacement surgery. But, well, I wouldn't do either of those things unless it was a really bad accident or something. But otherwise, I, I just wouldn't do it. Now, we see, like the example you mentioned, let's look at the connections based on this skeleton. So someone who has arthrosis of the hip always has shortened iliopsoas muscles. So, with them, the pelvis is always bent down, tilted. Because the front thigh muscles are too short. Or you can also say that the fascia in this area is stuck together. And if now the pelvis tilts down, the spine still wants to stand upright, then there is hyperlordosis. Hyperlordosis is a hollow back. The body wants to straighten up, but can't. The front fascial chain is shortened. The rear one is shortened anyway. And around the hip and pelvic area, everything is actually tense. Hip problems and back pain is very closely related and can hardly be told apart. What you would have to do now, you'd have to release these tensions and blockages in this area. So osteopaths, for example, are predestined for this work. I'd much rather see an osteopath, and anyway, being treated osteopathically is always good anyway, if the osteopath is good. Because we are full of fascial adhesions. I too, I, I'm quite agile. Even at almost 70, I have adhesions here and there. And adhesions prevent the movements and increase the pressure on the joints. And that's the problem, that these tensions, these adhesions in the, in the hip and back area because they put a massive increase in pressure on the joints. And through this increase in pressure, this, this wear and tear is, of course, accelerated. And the relieving posture is because of the shortening of the fascia. The fascial shortening is because of sitting. And that's also the reason that it tends to come earlier, because young people sit. The children have to sit at school. First graders have to sit. I find that completely... Well, this model that children have to sit in school, I, I find completely wrong. The monks used to study while walking. Who says you have to study while sitting? But that's the way it is in our society, unfortunately. And these shortenings create incorrect loads in the hip joint. And, and these incorrect loads, then when you get up, 
and also walk on flat, hard ground. Your feet just fold down. This then overloads the hip joint because the feet no longer work. Actually, the feet should account for the drive of our walk. But if your feet just fall down on the hard, fat, flat floor, then the hips have to work. And having the hip joints work in a misalignment gives that quick wear and tear. It's not overloads, it's incorrect loads. Uh, an incorrect load and having to take over a load for the feet. The hips aren't there to go forward so that we introduce one step at a time with the leg through the hip. This is not physiological and this causes rapid wear. Now we just have to walk differently. Now, of course, we know wear and tear is a situation in life. But we can see from you when I make a new decision and say, I want more mobility in my life, more health. You are, of course, I would say, an extreme role model. Of course, I also know from our conversations that you pay a lot of attention to your diet and, of course, also have this perfect walk. How was that for you? That one thing led to another, that the fascia changed with the diet and the feet, do you get an impression, a motivation, when you say, I'm supposed to have a new hip replacement next week, but for now, I'll let you convince me again, maybe take a turn? Yeah, just very quickly to me. 25 years ago, due to sports injuries, soccer injuries, I just had to change my walk. I lived in South Korea for 20 years, barefoot in the rice fields, and there I discovered that you can do a, a lot with walking, with changing your walk. And meanwhile, for 25 years, it has become my profession because I'm a mechanical engineer and a biomechanist by training. Of course, that played into my hands. But now, in this case, you can really just change the walk. And you'll notice in minutes that these hip pains, back pains, go away. What can happen then? We can quickly take a look at the pictures here. Oh, yes. And here you see how this hip area is blocked. Pelvis, hip. It's all cramped and stuck together by muscles, tendons, ligaments. Exactly. From sitting a lot, from constantly hitting the hard floors. You see, those feet just fall to the ground. So we recommend walking on elastic, springy material, not standing. If you have hip problems, you should walk, if possible. It doesn't matter if those feet move right or wrong. And this is very different with knee problems. There, the precise placement of the feet is extremely important. Otherwise, it won't work with knee arthrosis. In the case of hip and back problems, it's exactly the opposite. You should not walk slowly there. You should simply walk on the elastic, springy material. Or you can just do it at home by walking and vigorously rolling the foot, or even try a relaxed trot. And in the forest, barefoot. Very good. In nature, even better, or best of all, on soft lawn. Grass, forest floor, moss, walking barefoot. You immediately feel that 
these tensions, these blockages in the area dissolve. Then you still have this de-acidifying effect. The body can also do this via the foot. Yeah, but that's only secondary. The primary thing is really the mechanics that release the tension. What you also once said to me, if someone has mental stress, that this also causes tension on the whole organism. Well, mental stress causes tension. Mental stress tenses the back, especially the inner organs, so the digestive system and, and via the digestive system. Also the back, the hips and the, the pelvis, and vice versa. If I walk like this all the time and have back pain, it gets on my psyche. It becomes a vicious circle. It, it creates a mutual tension. And that's why I said in the beginning that such tension, such blockages, can also be overcome with other means, symptomatically. For example, with massages. Just a massage alone is good. Or better in fa fascial therapy or with dry needling or whatever, or, or with some grease and ointment. You can also solve blockades everywhere. But in the long term, walking correctly is part of it. And it's then also the method that fights the problem at the root. Because sitting too much and walking and standing on hard, flat floors is the cause. And if you want to solve this at the cause, then you walk on forest floor. You can also jog easily in shoes that are relatively flexible. Now, it usually helps with back problems. If it doesn't help with hip problems, then what you need to do on the fascia here, in the thigh area, especially in the iliopsoas, which has fascial adhesions in this area, <laughs> is stretching exercises, where you just stretch the front thigh muscles. And that's part of it. When you walk on our soles, on our shoes, soft, springy, don't stand, because that would be good for knee problems, but not for hip problems. Walk, and then you notice a release immediately. But it can be that there is a dragging pain here. And there's a difference between stabbing pain and dragging pain. If you just go jogging and can't do it anymore with hip problems, then you think, yeah, now I'm going to operate. If especially joggers or people who like to run can no longer run because of hip problems, then the pain is stabbing. And that stabbing pain that, that comes because the hip isn't open, like on the left, everything is open there. Does the step also point outwards a bit, or does the foot move as well? Well, can you maybe sh just show the next slide? You might see it there. When you walk like this one with your feet, so powerful, then there's movement. You can see a rotation in the thoracic spine. This then triggers the arm swing. Just compare the left and right arm swing. Also the neck position. The posture of the head comes back. On the left, the head is over the shoulder, over the hip over the center of gravity, where you put your foot. And on the right, everything is forward. And that gives a huge pull on the shoulder, but also a huge pressure on the hip. And intervertebral discs are also very obvious. Well, because we're taking hip surgery, we're talking hip surgery now, there's a total overpressure in the event of incorrect strain. Incorrect strain because the hips are too far forward. Walking correctly, like on the left, helps. So rolling off powerfully. You could also roll it off while jogging. Do it vigorously, but easily while jogging. And then it certainly doesn't stab. 
When you roll, it no longer stabs your hips. But it can be that the stabbing pain turns into a dragging pain. And that's a good sign. If the dragging pain's there, then you have to loosen the fascial adhesions. For example, with a, an osteopath. And then, if you do both, the fascial adhesions in this area are, of course, later loosened all over the body. Then, in most cases, you can solve these hip problems in this innovative, conservative way without having to operate. Because every operation brings in another, a next problem. Yes, if you bring it up like that, next problem. There are people who had an artificial hip installed the first time and then a few months later they come and say, I'll have my second hip soon. And then I think about it. Is it true with this one hip surgery that they are pain free as promised or can they still feel a change with your shoes? What's the feedback like there? People who get surgery usually don't just have one. There comes, as you say, the left side, then the right side. And often the, the left hip comes and then the right knee. And this all happens because the cause is not actually being fought. They walk like that. Someone who's had hip surgery is walking the same way as the person on the right. You walk the same way. It will not improve. That means you become even more immobile when you have an operation. Surgery is always possible, always at the expense of mobility. And when mobility in the hips is restricted, the knees are subjected to even more stress. Because where mobility is lacking, this must be compensated by other joints. Joints, as you can see on the left, starting with the ankle, knee, hip joint, then all vertebrae, then mobility of the thoracic spine, which triggers the reactive arm swing, and brings this rotation into the person. This rotation is extremely important, so that the muscles are relaxed. If the rotation is no longer there, the muscles tense up more and more. Mobility becomes less and less. If there are operations, then the blows, which you can see on the right, are in these knees. They get bigger and bigger. And then there's knee surgery. At the end, ankles are stiffened. Vertebral stiffening. It's a real business. Well, I don't want to judge that. Everyone has to do that themselves. It's, it's good when business is good. Then there are also jobs, but it must also help the patient. So first and foremost, it has to help the patient. I was just going to say, I mean, basically, we're all on our own. And if I'm really faced with the diagnosis of hip surgery, what should be done now? What else can I look at before I get into the operating room? I can walk barefoot at home first and see what happens on a, on a soft carpet. Even better, of course, if you have something elastic, something springy. Maybe you have such a, a mini trampoline at home where you bounce a bit and then rotate a bit. And if that's better, then that is a sign that something can be done, that opportunities are emerging. If it's a different pain, if the pain changes, if the stabbing pain then develops into a dragging pain, that's a great sign that more can be done. And that would mean maybe even walking on a mat, in a keep and joy shop, not standing, but even trotting very lightly and a light jog on these soft elastic mats. And the best thing that can happen to you is when a stabbing pain turns into a dragging pain. That's the sure sign that you still have to loosen fascia. And in the future, it will be as elastic and springy as possible so that the feet move, so that all the wrong forces, these false forces that 
blocked that pelvis, that these wrong forces go down into the feet because that's where the power unit is. And uh, the car, the wheels are also the drive where the power is brought to the ground. That has to be the feet and no longer the hips. Then the forces go away from the hips into the feet and that works in most cases. Then the pain goes away. Where are possibilities to find these shops? Under Kibun, that's K-Y-B-U-N, Joya, that's J-O-Y-A, online. The shops are in 50 countries. In most regions, there are such Kibun Joya shops where you can try it out and also take such shoes home, risk-free, for two weeks. And then you can try it out. Then you don't have to operate and just hope and worry that things will be better afterwards. Yes, great. Thank you very much, dear Carl, that with all the knowledge you have accumulated over the years, you created such a great work here for the people. Thanks. Thank you, Karina. And see you soon. Dear viewers, so it's definitely worth it for one or the other to start moving before rushing into the operating room. If there is no longer a way, then it's wonderful that this technology also exists. But as long as it still works without a scalpel, we're all happy, aren't we? I wish you a good time and see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye.